Hi, in this video we bring you the audiobook of this successful novel. If you love a filthy mouthed, possessive alpha you will love this. Caution, be prepared for one wild, steamy ride. Listen at your own risk. Leave your like and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Tease Me, a dark billionaire mafia romance, Dark Odyssey Book 1. Page 21. Chapter 6, MIA. No, please no. I scream. I try to rush into the room as if that will help but someone grabs me. I look around to see Antonio, one of Hector's thugs. I hate him as much as I do Hector. He always does something to hurt me. They haven't had cause to come here in months. Why are they here now? There's four of them in the room along with Hector and Antonio. Hector pulls the trigger back on the gun he's pointing at Dad and smiles wide at me. Please no, I wail. Fucking hell, both Dad and Beth are crying. No? Hector screams back at me. He rushes forward and gets right up in my face. Antonio tightens his grip around my body and I can barely breathe. I feel like I'm going to faint, he's squeezing so tight. I scream out from the pain. Yes, bitch scream. That's what you'll be doing all day when all of us take a turn to fuck you. Hector laughs in my face and the others join in. Tears roll down my cheeks too. I could actually imagine that happening to me. I would just die. Then again I'm sure they would kill me after they'd finished with me. What the hell happened? Why are they here? And, what the fuck pissed them off like this? I need to be calm. I need to be calm. It's only by being calm that I can talk to this guy. He doesn't like anyone thinking they have the upper hand on him. Even if you do something simple like answer in the wrong tone he'll snap. I learned that the hard way a few months back when he answered me with a punch to my face. What happened? I ask. What happened, Chica? He snarls. Hector has a tattoo of a snake going down the side of his face. It runs from the corner of his eye down to the edge of his jaw. It moves when he shouts, contorting with fangs when he yells. I'm sure it was done like that on purpose, to make him look more nightmarish. All of them look like that, and I just want them gone from my house. I don't know what happened. I catch my breath and try to stay calm. Okay, Princesca, I'll tell you. Your fucking father dearest owes me money. My gaze snaps to dad. That's impossible, we've been paying. I've been giving him the money to make the payments. I know the payments have been made, so this must be some mistake. The look on his face though suggests otherwise. We had the money, where would it have gone? What happened to it? What could have happened to it? Dad looks down, his gaze falls to the hardwood floor and he puts an arm around Beth. I know in that moment what happened to the money. One word, one name. Page 22. Carter. Dad must have given him the money for something. I start crying because I can't believe he'd do that again. I've sacrificed so much. So much and Dad's still giving Carter money. How much is owed? I stutter. Two months Princesca, with interest. Your father made the mistake of thinking I would show him some compassion. Hector stalks back to Dad, hits him with the back of the gun and Dad falls back against the floor howling with pain. Stop it. Beth screams. She's screaming and crying. But Hector starts kicking Dad over and over again. Please no, I have the money. I scream on top of my lungs. It's only then that he stops and comes back to me. I have the money, I repeat. The money Chloe gave me. I have that. That is what I have. Oh God. I can't believe I have it. You have it, he asks. I have it. In my purse there's a check for five grand, I nod vigorously. He yanks my purse from me. Right off my shoulder. He digs around until he gets to my wallet with my cards and the check. 
A maddening smile crosses his face when he looks back at me. He waves the check in front of my face and smiles wider. Payment received, but guess what, seeing as how it's late I need compensation and interest. Ten grand more for the trouble. Ten grand. Jesus Christ, what an asshole. I don't have any more, I gasp in horror. How can he be so cruel? How? He grabs my face and squeezes me hard. I'm sure there are fingernail marks in my skin and possibly his dug in so hard, he's cut me. Ah. You don't have it, he says in a sing-song voice. That's a shame, Chica. He twists around and aims the gun at Dad. Hector pulls the trigger back again. Click clack. That sound ripples through my being and sounds like doom. He steps closer to dead ready to release the trigger and kill him. No, please. I bawl out. I don't have any more. Please can you just give me a chance to get it? From where? Oh God in heaven, my brain's already computing for me. Already jumping ahead and giving answers. The job at the club. I can get ten grand. I can. If the job's still mine I can get that money and give it to Hector. Please give me a few days. Please, I beg. Hector looks around to me and laughs. Three days Chica, or your papi gets it in his head, we sell the little girl, and, you. He moves closer and sickens me when he fills his palms with my breasts. This is not like Nick touching me. That was different. You come with me, and we will all fuck you until you beg for death. As if his words and touching me wasn't enough to jar me, he has to move to my face and lick the side of my cheek. I shuffle away but he steps back anyway and Antonio releases me. I crumble to my knees and crawl over to Dad and Beth while the men leave. They walk out with self-satisfying confidence because they know they own us. Page 23 I can't take the time to be disgusted. Dad looks really hurt. Blood runs down the side of his face and trickles from his nose. He's crying and I know it's from a different kind of pain. I don't waste time talking or asking him why. Hector kicked him so many times and he's already weak. I need to get him to the hospital. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I arrange for Beth to spend the night with our next door neighbors. The Pattersons have always been nice to us. Their daughter is the same age as Beth and sometimes they have sleepovers. Never at our house though, which is fine. I wouldn't feel comfortable. It's not safe for anybody to come to our place. It's not even safe for us to be there. Dad goes into hospital and the doctors check him over. He has a broken rib. We lie and tell them he slipped and fell down the stairs. He has to stay in for a few days which is shit for me because it means I have to get a babysitter for Beth. Although I've been with Dad for the last few hours, we haven't really spoken about what happened. He gives me looks of embarrassment and guilt here and there, that's all. Now we're alone and he's looking at me. I think you should go home, he says. I blow out a breath and shake my head. Go home Dad. That's what you have to say to me. I'm actually so mad at him I shouldn't speak. He's the one in hospital, not me. But, I don't understand why he'd put us in danger the way he is. Again, and for Carter. M.I.A., Carter needed the money. He was going to lose his home. That's what he said. He was behind in rent by a couple of months and I just thought I'd help and hoped that Hector would understand. He stops to draw in a shallow breath. Carter said he would give it back. He promised. I bite back tears. But you knew he wouldn't dad. I say that far too harshly and the flash of pain in his eyes makes me feel bad. It highlights the nasty bruise that formed on the side of his face. I did. I just hoped, M.I.A. I'm guessing Chloe helped you with the five grand. She's an angel and she saved us. But I won't make you find ten grand from wherever it is you plan to find it. This is on me and I must suffer the consequences. My heart stills and stops beating in my chest. 
he is talking about. God, the only consequence he means is death. He's given up. I shake my head and tears spill down my cheeks. Dad, are you crazy? M.I.A., take Beth and leave. Take her and go. There's no good ending to this madness. His skin looks paler against his dark blonde hair, and his green eyes that are usually brighter in appearance are tired and weary. Hector will kill you dad, I point it out even though I know that's his intention. Hector will kill you. I know. He reaches for my hand and covers it with his. M.I.A., I feel so ashamed for what happened tonight. You won't understand why I do certain things until you have your own children someday. It's difficult to just turn your back on your own child. I know Carter is a bad person. I know he's dangerous and he doesn't care. I know all those things but I can't be that father who stops being a father to my son. I promised your mother I would love both of you and take care of you. Mom died when I was three. She had leukemia. I don't remember much about her, but I remember enough. I remember her face and her smiles, and her love. That is what I remember about her and I think it's what she'd want me to remember. Especially how much she loved us. I get it. I get what dad's saying. It doesn't help me much though and I can't just leave. I close my eyes and wall the tears away. I wall them away because I can't break now. I have to think because I can't turn my back on him either. He's my father and I can't allow someone to kill him. I know they'll do it. There is no question about that. I know Hector won't hesitate to kill dad. He'll do it in a heartbeat. Maybe less than that. I have three days to get the money. I have three days and I can't fuck this up. Page 24 I stand up knowing what I have to do. It must be verging on eleven. It's late but awareness of the time as in night and day is for people who aren't desperate. My awareness of time is a countdown on what I can get done with the time I have left. What are you doing? Dad asks. Don't worry dad. I'll get the money. You shouldn't have to. Don't ask Chloe, it's not fair. I'm not asking her. He was right it wasn't fair, not when Chloe had given me the means to get myself out of this shit. She said she would work at the Dark Odyssey and she wouldn't say no to Nick. Who was I to? Tonight was the second night I could have been working and I'd been a foolish woman trying to hold onto her dignity. There's a job, I'm going to try and get it. I can ask for an advance if I get it. It means I can sort everything out. A hundred grand. I can't tell him that part. Dad's not stupid. He's fully clued up and a quick study. He'll know straight away what sort of work I'll be doing if I say more than that. A job? He narrows his eyes. Yeah. It's not at a law firm but the pay is good. I'm going to go sort that out. I nod. What kind of job is it MIA? He keeps his gaze on me. Although there is bruising around his eye I can see the wealth of worry. It's helping out some people who own a shipping company. That was what I'd read nights ago about the Giordano family. They're into the exporting and importing business. It's their primary source of income and seems like a family-run business. I guess it's one of the things they do. Dad doesn't look entirely convinced but he nods. M.I.A., at the first sign of trouble you take Beth and leave. You hear me? I sniffle and ball my fists to keep in the emotion. You're seriously asking me to let you die? Yes, because just as I can't turn my back on Carter, I can't allow you to suffer for our mistakes. Not you and not Beth. I can't listen to any more of this. Time is going wasting. I don't answer, I just walk out and leave. I jump in my car and head straight back to the club. Page 25. Chapter 7, MIA. It's nearly midnight by the time I get there. Limos are parked out front and valets are tending to the people coming and going. There's a parking lot to the side but Chloe told me the VIPs get the front entrance parking. 
Those are the wealthy billionaire types and tycoons who have money galore. I walk into the club and follow a couple to the reception area. The man is dressed in a suit, while the woman is in a kimono-type dressing gown. I already know that underneath she's wearing lingerie but it must be barely there because I can see far too much outlining her body. A woman, different from the last receptionist, hands them some really classy masquerade masks and the man places his hand on the woman's ass as he leads her away. I get to the receptionist next and I do what I was instructed to do on my last visit here. Hi, I'm M.I.A. Chase. Can I speak to Nick please? I know it's late but is he possibly here? The woman gives me a curious look. She's not as friendly as the last receptionist. In fact the look she now gives me isn't a good one. The receptionist doesn't say anything to me. She just reaches for the phone and in seconds she's speaking to Nick. You can go up to his office. She tells me when she hangs up. I don't miss the little scowl on her face, but I don't have time for shit. I can be bitchy too and I do because I don't say thanks. I just walk away and follow the path I thought I wouldn't walk again. I get to the balcony overlooking the floor of the club and instantly my bravado fades. It's replaced by shock. Instead of the fascination I had with the grand decor I'd compared to pictures of Venice and the comparison I'd made days ago to the grand halls I visited in Rome, I'm more taken with the people around me, and what they're doing. There's the usual upbeat tempo club mix you'd find in a normal club and the main floor has people dancing around as normal. What's not normal is that everyone is wearing lingerie and masquerade masks. What's even more not normal for me is that on the outskirts of the floor there are people having sex. As in actual sex. Real sex. Just like that, out in the open for all to see. The sight makes me want to reach for my glasses just to be sure what I'm seeing is what I'm seeing but then I remember I'm already wearing them. I'd put them on back at the hospital when I had to fill out the forms for dad's stay and give my details. I'm nearsighted so I don't always need glasses and I know right now is one of those times. I don't need glasses to confirm what I'm seeing. There are at least a hundred people in this hall and at least 25% of them are having sex while the others dance around in masquerade masks and sexy lingerie. It actually looks like some dark, erotic fantasy. More than porn, for the way some of them touch each other. Not that I'm some porn expert. I've just seen enough to know what's porn and what's not. This is something in between, just like everything else about this place. It feels like I'm here in body but not really in mind. Even with my mountain of problems, it throws me. It absolutely throws me. I'm standing on the first floor and I can see everything that needs to be seen and I'm so stunned I can't look away. The setting is a masquerade party for sure. It's that hands down, but like something pulled from someone's wild imagination. What's happening below is one thing but then I see that I'm actually even closer to the action than I thought. It was a woman's loud moan that pulls my eyes away from the main floor. She moans again loudly, as the music changes and I see that the little Arabian-style cubicles I passed the other day have people inside. I'm supposed to go down the pathway. Down that pathway there, but I have to pass six of those cubicles to get to the end. Page 26 Remembering why I'm here, I walk, but as soon as I get to the first cubicle I stop short, stunned again. Inside the cubicle is one woman with four guys. All naked. She's sandwiched between two guys in a double penetration. One fucking her in her pussy, the other in her ass. Both inside her while she gives the third guy a blowjob and the fourth guy a hand job. The guy she's riding sucks her tits while he pounds into her. The guy behind her pounds hard into her ass. It's like porn central come to life. My whole body burns with discomfort, and, arousal. I get my answer to what it would be like to work here. Just from watching. This is what it would be like. I notice I haven't really seen a waitress yet, but then maybe she is the waitress. I look away when my whole body starts to blush but only to find myself staring straight at a couple that just came into view on an aerial hoop that must be on some rotating device because I didn't see them before. 
all they are wearing are masks. That's it. Both are naked and in some contorted position on the hoop where their legs are elevated and entwined with the hoop just so you can see they're having sex. Just slowly. Very. Slowly. The woman has a rapturous expression on her face while the man strokes her stomach and kisses her neck. I have to admit I'm actually fascinated by them, and shit, they're not the only ones. Another hoop floats by with another couple doing the same, while the first couple float away into the darkness like it's a show. I guess though that's what it is. A show and they must work here too. Obviously, you'd have to be more than adventurous to go sailing around the air in an aerial hoop having sex. The reason I'm here comes back into my mind once more and I move away at the thought with the promise not to look at the other cubicles as I pass by. I see a few things though. Here on this floor is every pairing you can think of. Everything you can conjure up in a fantasy or otherwise. This is the dark odyssey. I can't believe Chloe comes here on the regular. I get to the end of the path in one piece and make my way to Nick's office. His door is ahead and it's ajar. I stop by it and pull in a deep, steady breath to shake the shock away. I know I can't act like that if I still have this job. I can't do it. I need to be liberal and accepting. This is a sex club. If I get the chance to work here there's going to be things happening and things I see that I'm not used to. End of story. I have to just remember the consequences of what could happen if I don't do it. I knock on Nick's door and just like the other day he answers in that deep voice. Pushing the door open reveals he's not alone. There are two other guys inside who look very similar to him. You can tell they're brothers straight away. They look like they were cut from the same masterpiece fabric. All gorgeous, and standing together they remind me of a GQ cover I once saw. It was in tribute to the sexiest men in Hollywood. These guys, sexy though they may be, are mobsters. I know I'm looking at, at least a big chunk of the Giordano family. Dangerous men, probably as dangerous and ruthless as Hector and his tribe. I can't, however, think of any of that now. I need this job whatever it is. They all look good, but my eyes go to Nick and it's not because I need him. It's because he still has that effect on me from last time. He's smoking a cigar and it makes him look a little older but sexier. They're all looking at me and no one is saying anything so I decide to talk. Hi, I'm good evening, can I talk to you please? I say to Nick, talking to him like we're in a place like a law firm. That was my professional voice. The guy to the left of him looks me over and I instantly feel out of place. Today was a serious dress-down day. Apart from my glasses, I'm wearing a red long-sleeved knitted shirt with the Hogwarts logo on the breast, cargo pants and my converses. I look like I'm heading to a college class. I'm barely even wearing makeup. All tonight was supposed to be about was meeting Chloe at the coffee shop yet so much has happened. Page 27 The guy to Nick's right looks me over and chuckles. There's a dimple in his left cheek and a twinkle in his eye I don't miss. He moves towards me and the guy on the left follows him. They approach and walk past without a word. I look back to Nick and he's still staring. Careful, I may get jealous if you keep looking at my brothers the way you are. He smirks and allows the cigar to dangle between his thumb and forefinger. I open my mouth to speak but again I have that feeling of not knowing what to say. They look like you. I bite down hard on my back teeth at my lame answer. I want to cut to the chase, but how? He chuckles and he gives me that wild look filled with sexual energy that always makes me wet when I think of what he did to me when last I was here. Come in and close the door, he instructs. I do. I do what he says and allow myself to get used to it. I need him to give me the job. I'm doing this for my family. Failure is not an option. It's not even a thing that enters my mind when I turn back to face him. Page 28 Chapter 8, Nick As she walks in I remember watching this documentary on the Discovery Channel when I was a kid. It was called Wild Africa. 
Frankie and Vincent were always watching shows like that and dragging me in because I used to be so squeamish. Back then I hated preying on the weak in any shape or form. I thought it was cowardly to do so. I even hated watching animals do it. Lions gathering around a gazelle to scare it because the gazelles knew it was already dead the minute they saw the lions coming. No hope of getting away, no hope or a fucking chance in hell of doing shit besides allowing itself to be eaten. Miss M.I.A. Chase reminded me of the gazelle tonight. Over the years as I got older and saw how the business worked, I knew that it wasn't about preying on the weak. It was about showing control and power. Allowing everyone to know who was boss and who had the power to do whatever they wanted to you. Weak ones and strong ones, it didn't matter who. If you were alpha you let them know you're alpha and there's no question after. My family consisted of a bunch of alphas. It was our dynamic and it worked. It was respect. That is why my brothers left us. One look at her and I could tell that both of them wanted her just as much as I did, but they knew she was mine. They knew of my interest in her from the minute I agreed to see her. We were in the middle of serious talks about plans. My plans on what I was going to do to investigate the situation with Tommy, outside of Vincent's warning. Salvatore and Gabe knew of my interest for this woman and knew I needed the distraction. I'm looking at her now in that get-up she's wearing. It's supposed to look casual and it does. She's supposed to look like she's lazing around the house and reading a newspaper in those dark-rimmed librarian fuck-me glasses but that's just the thing. Everything about her screams fuck me and I want to. I really want to bend her over my desk and fuck her brains out. I want to pin her to the wall behind her and fuck her all over again but like the documentary, I'm going to play a game. I'm going to play with her and set the ball in motion. It won't work in the state of desperation I see brimming in those deep green eyes. I put my cigar out and stand up, make my way around to her and sit on the edge of my desk. Missed you last night Angel Doll. Did you get the days mixed up? No, I. She stops and presses her lips together, hesitating. I didn't get this job by being stupid or out of touch with reality. I don't know many women who would turn down a hundred grand to work with me, let alone be with me. Even if she didn't know exactly what I was offering no woman has ever said no to me. Yet this one implied it big time with her absence. I knew from the get-go that she isn't going to be like the usual type of woman that ventures here. I know she's not the type to give in to her fantasies the way I do, or do what she feels like in the moment. I know now that something brought her back here. The what would be interesting to find out. I look at her in anticipation, waiting for her to finish talking and she doesn't. She's just looking at me. This is far too much staring and looking and assessing. We should be touching. We should be fucking, but I'm game for a good play. Oh. I get it, you came back to explore the wild chemistry I said we wouldn't be ignoring. I taunt. If I was myself I would have at least found out where she lived well before now. I may have all the shit with Tommy going on in my head but I couldn't get this woman out of my head either. No. I mean, I really need this job. If it's still there. If it's still available I'd like to try again. I would like another chance if there is one. She wrinkles her nose slightly and blinks like she's trying to hold back tears. Page 29. I smile. She really doesn't realize what I offered was tailored to her. A chance to be mine. There is no opening like that or chance and if I wasn't so taken with her I'd turn her away. I'd turn her away no matter what sent her here. People know what to expect from me. Women know to expect nothing from me beside a good time. That is all. A good fuck and then goodbye. I just want this one because she's interesting. Distracting because we're complete opposites. Like night and day. Now she's the one looking at me in anticipation. Waiting for my answer. Why should I give you another chance, angel doll? I tilt my head to the side. You never showed up for work last night and you never called either. Shows lack of interest. 
I'm a busy man and I don't have time for shit like that. Her lips part. I can assure you it won't happen again. I'll be honest I didn't plan to come in, or come back. No? I ask, as if I don't know. No. I'm not used to. I'm not used to being so intimate with a stranger, she confesses and boy does my interest pique. I stand, straightening, and she instantly flinches. I'm like the lion wanting to check out my prey. She backs into the wall as I move to her and I place my hands either side of her as I look her over and continue in my pursuit of figuring her out. She's not a virgin. That would have been one hell of an interesting capture, but I like my women wild in bed. I like them to know what to do on some level, although I like taking control and being the dominant. I'm looking at her and I guess she's the kind of woman to have been in a few relationships. No one-nighters. She's a relationship girl. She's the long-term woman you have that's not a side piece. She's the type you want for a wife and to mother your children. She's the angel who'll love you. I almost back away at the realization as something moral comes into my mind that makes me want to shy away from her, but I don't. It's like not wanting to desecrate what's considered hallowed in a church. That's the vibe I get from her in her essence, but her eyes tell a different story. Her eyes tell me she wants me too. Me the devil, and she doesn't care that I'm a stranger. I recall the way she never exactly refuted my comment about the chemistry we shared. Never said no. And she's still not saying no. What have you done? I ask, leaning closer. What do you mean? You know what I mean. How many men have you been with Angel Dole? She gives me a long hard look and pain speckles her eyes. Some bastard hurt her. I can tell. One, she answers, holding my gaze. I have to say I'm very surprised. Didn't expect that. One? Yeah. College, I met him in college. How long were you with him? Six years. That part doesn't surprise me. It fits. She's the long-term type. And where is he? I prod. He cheated and we broke up. Oh, and no one since. Page 30. No. No one. I haven't had the time. I smile at that. It's such a lame excuse. People can always make time to spend with each other. It's based on whether you want to or not. She shuffles and I see a bruise under her chin. I'm not sure how I didn't notice before. It's right there under her chin and it wasn't there the other day. It looks like finger marks. She flinches again when I take hold of her face but she doesn't look away. Who did this? I ask. I don't know the specs but that mark came from someone squeezing her face. I know I'm right when I shift her jaw, tilting it up and I see more finger marks right under her chin. I know I'm absolutely right when a tear runs down her cheek and she tries to look away. I can be a sick fuck but I don't do violence to women. Never. It's nothing. It's okay. I'm okay. She brings her hand up to wipe away the tears and blinks the rest away. I get the impression the marks on her face are part and parcel of what brought her back to me. I haven't even factored in yet how desperate she must be to come to me at this hour of the night, asking for a chance for a job. I'm not the kind of guy to prod and poke around when someone doesn't want to talk. I have my ways of finding info. I'll have her follow tomorrow. Someone who can dig around a little. It would be so much better if she tells me though. Just for a minute I want her to forget. I'm looking at her and it doesn't take long for that pull of chemistry to rush back in on me. We had a minute, maybe two. Just long enough for her to talk to me. Now I want her to forget. You need the money, I state. It's the obvious but I state it. Cut the shit, cut the beating around the bush. Yes. I need the money. I need an advance too of ten grand. A wayward tear runs down her cheek. I'm not sure if she realizes. 
she's still just looking at me. Jesus, ten grand. This doll must be in some kind of shit. I will most definitely have her checked out. That's not exactly spare change. Is the job still available, she asks weakly. Yes, it is. Can I have it? I swear I won't let you down. I work hard. I'll do anything to show I can. Anything? I take off her glasses and set them on the shelf next to us. She nods when I look back to her. Anything. She blinks then resumes her focus but she reaches up to her top to undo the first button and then the next. She seems so childlike in the Hogwarts top. Innocent and willing to offer me her body for the job. She goes to undo the other buttons but I stop her. No, it doesn't work like that. I won't fuck you in exchange for a job. If I want a slut I can go downstairs, I can hit up the back streets. Or I can do nothing. I'm Nicoli Giordano. I don't have to try. She looks thrown, trapped. What do you want? I get close again. You. Me. I like the way she says that. Yes, angel doll. I want you. I want to own you. I wanted her to want me too, and I already had that. It was time to test it out. Her lips part again and my gaze drops there. Page 31 Right there on her full, pink lips. The pout makes me wonder what that mouth of hers will feel like on my cock. Right now I want to taste her. It's time that I taste her. I lean closer and she swallows hard. I get even closer until I'm a breath away, and my cheek brushes over her nose. It's clear I'm going to kiss her, but I stop right there. The kiss I want will taste so much better if she meets me halfway, or the rest of the way. Hesitation takes her, but desire is a stronger force. Much stronger. My cock hardens right up when the angel moves to me, meeting me the rest of the way. It's her that kisses me, and it's not because she needs the money. As her lips press against mine I feel her desperation to taste me too. It's the same as mine. It's the fucking same as mine. I slant my mouth over hers and our tongues sweep in to meet each other in tandem like we planned it. Fuck. She tastes so fucking good. Like wild raw honey and sex. It reminds me a little of the taste of her sweet nectar. This is different. It's mixed with a hint of greed and selfish desire coming from both of us, not just me. I take control by pulling that band from her hair and the long blonde locks tumble over her back. Then I run my fingers through the silky fibers and angle her face to the side so I can deepen the kiss. I'm in charge and I take pleasure in the way that her body goes limp against mine, pressing against my chest. My dick is rock hard already but when she presses her tits into me I want to explode. We kiss and the kiss turns hungry then greedy. She moans into my mouth and I fill my palms with her gorgeous tits. I recall with perfect clarity how perfect she is. And I decide I want to go slower with her tonight. Last time was an interview. She's working tonight and I'm giving her a preview. Giving the induction session of what's to be expected on the job. I pull away from her and she moves back to me, wanting more. I plan to give her more. A lot more. Before she has her next thought I usher her over to the sofa area in the office I use for meetings. It's perfect for this meeting. When I take off her shoes she knows I mean business. I'm loving the way she allows me to take charge and she's not saying no. I tell her I want to own her and she allows me to act like I already do. I unzip her pants, pull them down her legs, and toss them over to the side. Next are those panties. I spare no time to pull those off either, part her legs and slide my fingers deep inside her slick wet pussy. She's so wet for me it makes my cock ache to be inside her. I yank off her top and take off the bra too. Those gorgeous breasts spill out and bounce from the movement of my fingers sliding in and out of her. She moans as I finger fuck her and widens her legs so I can have better access. I stop for a moment to push her back against the cushions so she can lie down. 
She does it and lies there watching me. I take the moment to look at her. She's fucking beautiful. So fucking beautiful, lying there looking at me with that white blonde hair, her perfect body, those full rounded breasts with her light pink nipples and my fingers inside her pussy. Feel good, angel doll. Something that feels like triumph washes over me when she nods and I lower to suck her tits. Page 32. Chapter 9, MIA. I lose me mind all over again the minute his mouth closes over my right nipple. I can't even ask myself if I've gone crazy. I have. The answer is simple. I have totally lost my damn mind. It was far too late when I realized this man and I must never touch again. Our bodies must never touch. Not like we did the other day, and definitely not like we are now. It's too late and I want him to do whatever he wants to me. It was the kiss. No, it wasn't just that. This started from the other day when I first saw him. It was like there was this invisible entity that wanted us to be together. Attraction, chemistry, desire. I don't know. His touch is all of it. All of it, it's all there. My body is drugged up on passion. It's there all over me, burning me, heating me up, humming through the blood in my veins like a song I just remembered. It awakens me. Bad enough that that kiss robbed me of sanity, this is something else and all his doing is sucking my breast. His touch feels different tonight. I'm not sure if it's because my body remembers him, or if something changed between us. How can it though? This is the second time I've met this man and look at me. I can't help but look at the way he suckles on my breast. Hard then soft, then like his tasting, or drinking. His tongue swells around my nipple and it tightens painfully, making me arch my back into the cushion. I moan and he takes a break from sucking to look at me. Passion has him too. It glitters his eyes. His eyes are dark with it and darken all the more when he moves to play with my left breast. He takes the nipple between his thumb and fingers and rolls it. I can see it in his expression that he's enjoying what he's doing to me. I enjoy it too but, how the fuck can I be experiencing this when only hours ago, I nearly witnessed Hector kill Dad. The thought makes me flinch. Nick catches my face and turns me to focus on him. He shakes his head. Leave it outside. I said I want you. Stop thinking about that other stuff. How does he know? How does he know what I'm thinking? I must be so transparent. So obvious. And stupid. It's got to be midnight now and I'm here asking for a job. Of course I look desperate. It doesn't take Einstein to figure that. Not at all. I look transparent and desperate all by myself. Stop thinking angel doll. His voice is husky, filled with need and arousal. A wicked smile flashes over his face and he moves in to suckle on my left breast. I love his mouth on me. I love what he's doing to me with his mouth and I don't want him to stop. He strokes the other nipple he just gave attention, caressing the taut peak while he works the tip of the nipple in his mouth to life. The greedy tug of an orgasm takes me in an instant and he pulls away. One finger slides inside my pussy and the smile on his face is now one of satisfaction. Good girl, you're so wet. So wet for me. So fucking wet. He places two fingers in and starts moving in and out, finger fucking me. Page 33. I cry out against the intensity. It feels so damn good. So damn good and I realize how badly I need this. I want him too. I want him inside me. I want to forget everything and get lost in him. Just as the thought hits me, he pulls his fingers out and licks the glistening juice. Open your legs wide for me angel doll. He's looking at me as if he's given me a challenge. As if I won't do it, but he knows I will and I do. He shuffles back and I open my legs wide for him. Open your pussy for me, now. I move my hands down to my mound and spread my pussy lips wide for him. 
He smiles that predatory smile from the other day and it makes me shiver. When he lowers again, I gasp. He moves to my pussy and nuzzles his face between my thighs. Before I know it his tongue thrusts right in and I cry out. The intensity is so strong I grab onto the leather on the sofa seat to keep my balance and keep my mind from drifting away. He holds down my hips then presses deeper with the skill of a man who knows what he's doing. He licks and thrusts at the same time. Fast, faster and faster and it's all too much. It's too much. When he licks over the hard sensitive knob of my clit, hitting my G-spot with his fingers and starts a series of short licks and sucks on my clit, I scream. I actually scream out and at the same time the greedy orgasm sends me to climax and I come against his tongue, bucking and thrashing against his face as it all flows from me. He drinks me up, licking and sucking, continuing to eat out my pussy like it's the best thing he's ever tasted. I'm breathing so hard, and damn it, damn me, I want more. I don't just want his fingers or his tongue inside me. I want his cock. One last lick and he pulls back. I fully expect him to take his clothes off and fuck me right here. I'm ready for him. I want him. I need him. Only, he doesn't. What Nick does is move over me. Slides up to me and press his forehead against mine for a few brief seconds. He shuffles again and presses his cock into my stomach showing me how aroused he is. He moves back slightly and his warm breath on my face drives me insane. Feel better, he asks. I pant and he runs his fingers over my jaw. M.I.A., do you feel better? Yes. I tell him and my cheeks burn with shame. Can you give yourself to me? Yes. I didn't think no was an option. To my surprise he moves away and stands. I straighten up watching him. My eyes drop to the hard, massive bulge of his cock pressing against his pants and he smiles. You don't get to see that tonight, he smirks and runs his gaze over my naked body. Why? I ask. I can't believe I ask him such a thing. He lowers back to me. Your first time with me won't be you thinking about all the shit on your mind. Or money. I reach for my top but he stops me. Cupping my face again, he drifts back to me, advancing back to my lips. He brushes his lips over mine and drags me back into the sexual haze. I kiss him back and find my fingers running up his arm, holding him to me. He shuffles away from my lips, and his gaze drops to my fingers on his arm. Seven tomorrow night. You know not to pull the same shit as yesterday, he stands and my hands drops like a dead weight down at my thighs rushing against the bare skin. For your punishment for last night, the hours have changed slightly. Punishment? Lord. What are the changes? On the days you have off, I call on you when I need you. His face is stern. He's talking like I have some kind of office job and I'm his PA sign the contract and fill out the paperwork before you leave, understand. I nod my understanding. He backs away to the door and stops like he remembers something. Page 34 One last thing, he smiles. What? I breathe. Make sure you're on the pill. My eyes widen and it's like reality snaps back in. He leaves me again though. He's gone just like before and I'm left here naked in his office. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I filled out the forms and left them with the moody receptionist. There's copies for me to take home and go over. When I get home I spend hours milling over the contract and what I'm signing up to. It looks like a standard contract, except the part where it specifies my job title as personal waitress and explains in bold letters that my body belongs to Nicoli Giordano and I'm supposed to do what he says. Those are the job specs, title and description. It then goes on to list all the things I'm not to do. What stands out in my mind are the first three stipulations that are also typed in bold. I'm not to have sexual relations of any kind with any other men, I'm supposed to dress in the attire provided to me at the club, and since I'm considered to be his private property I'm supposed to consult him if I want to make any changes to myself. I.e., 
haircut, piercings, anything. Oh, but, then there's this part, the contract can be terminated at any point by either party. He can terminate it, or I can. I can terminate it. Under that is the details of the salary. It really is a hundred grand and that's the starting salary. There's no mention of when that will change like at the end of a trial period or anything like that. I never expected there to be details like that though. Just like the other thing this isn't mentioning. The part about how long the job lasts. I'm basically signing up to be this man's sex toy and while I may not be as well versed as most people in the world of men, I know the job can end when he's finished with me. Until that time I have to do what he says. That is what I signed up to. By the time I woke up this morning I got a text notification from the bank letting me know $20,000 has been deposited into my account. I'm so astounded I get dressed and go down to my bank to check if it's real. It's real. It's actually real. I get a printout of the balance and the reference for the payment is listed as staff benefit and advance in equal parts so I know what he's done for me. I asked for 10 grand and he gave me 20. 10 of which is mine to keep as a staff benefit. The shock that resides in the pit of my stomach is something I can't quite describe. I can't describe it because on the one hand, apart from Chloe, I don't have anybody who would look out for me like this. On the other hand he gave me the money and I haven't even started working for him yet. On the other, other hand, he gave me 10 grand to keep. Needless to say I wire the money across to Hector's account straight away. The next thing I do is go to the diner and order something to eat. I hate eating alone but I'm doing it. Having real money in my account brings back the realization that I haven't eaten properly in weeks. After I eat I allow myself to think about everything that's happening properly. Last night was crazy. I don't know what I'm doing but I know I'm in over my head. Way in. Last night was the first in a year since I've mentioned Chad too. My cheating ex. I don't even talk about him with Chloe and I should, because the reality of it is, he really hurt me deeply. When you're with someone for so long it's hard to become you again. Just you. Page 35. We broke up last year and yes he cheated, but he cheated with Miranda. He cheated on me with one of my friends. It's the reason why I'm not that close with her, and the reason why we're still some resemblance to the friends we used to be, is that she came and told me. She was the one who came and told me what was going on. If it had been just the one time, Maybe I would have been more open to push it all aside and give her credit for stepping forward and owning up to what was going on. But no, it wasn't that. She'd been sleeping with him for years and honestly I think she told me because she got pregnant and he didn't want the baby. It was one big bust up that left me heartbroken and blaming myself for the long distance relationship we'd had. After Harvard, Chad came back to Chicago with me because we planned to be here. My friends became his friends and it was all nice. Then I got the job in LA with Silverman's. At no point whatsoever did he seem bothered by it. He was fine, or so I thought. In our big bust-up he told me how selfish I was. How I never thought of him when I decided to move to L.A, and what did I expect him to do? When I answered that I never expected him to cheat on me with one of my friends, he thought I was in the wrong. He made it seem like it was during that time but he didn't know that I knew he'd been sleeping with Miranda for years before I left for LA. We broke up and I didn't want to speak to anyone for months. What brought me out of my shell was hearing that Miranda was in a car accident and lost her baby. Pushing the past out of my head, I look ahead at the waitress making her way toward me. Can I get you anything else, she asks with a pleasant smile. Yes. Can I have an extra large chocolate shake please? She nods, drops her foot back and retracts her steps to the kitchen. I have a long day ahead of me. I planned out everything earlier. I'm gonna get a babysitter for Beth who can look after her in the evenings. The Pattersons have agreed to have her for the rest of the week or more if we need. They were really worried when they heard about Dad and they know how hard I've been trying to find work. It's nice of them to offer to help but I don't want to impose so I'll accept the help for the rest of the week and get a babysitter after. 
I'll visit dad in an hour and prep everything. Prepare for tonight. Well, at least I fixed one thing. Kind of, sort of. I stopped Hector from killing dad. I paid the money. Now I have to do the rest. I told Nicoli Giordano I'd be his. What does it mean to be his? Be with a man who I just met in the way he wants me to. I have to do this for my family, that's what I'm telling myself. At the same time, I know that it's not the entire truth. Yes I agreed to the bizarre contract and signed my body away to a man I don't know because I need the money for my family, but last night was testament that it's so much more than that. I can lie to myself all I want and paint this in whatever colour I wish. I can do all of that but I can't change the truth. It's a truth that stirs shame in the pit of my stomach. The truth is, I want him too. I really must have lost my mind. Page 36 Chapter 10 Nick Gabe Ison the phone talking to one of his women. I don't know which one it is this time. Can't keep up. It only bothers me because I need to talk to him now and he's on the fucking phone talking it up with this broad about what she's wearing. It's just him and me tonight. Salvatore is back at the accountancy office dealing with one of our clients who had 10 million come in from a business deal. He's better at shifting the larger sums of money around and hiding it to make it either look legit or off the books. He manages all the offshore accounts, while me and Gabe do the onshore stuff. A few years back Par expanded the accountancy work we do to include private clients. So we currently take care of the money coming in from the shipping contracts and money from our other clients too. Gabe and I are sitting on the upper level of the club reserved for just us. We have different levels for different people. The whole top section is ours. It's what we call the viewing section. We sit up here and we can see everything below us. Three levels down. He laughs out loud and ignores the fuck out of me like he used to when we were kids when I cast him a seething glare. He must be taken with her because he's been on the phone now for twenty minutes. I would prefer if he went elsewhere with the shit. I'm in no mood to hear him talk to some doll who's chasing him, and not when I know he's been banging Mimi down in the dressing rooms. That's definitely not Mimi on the phone. He acts different when he's around her. He likes her well enough but she's not his type and the poor doll can't see for shit when it comes to him. She's been in our lives for as long as I can remember. Her father is another family friend and since he doesn't mind our special tastes, she doesn't mind working for us. She deals with the waitresses and the new recruits. Been with us right from when we opened ten years ago. But she's had her eye on Gabe for as long as we've known her. His problem is the same as mine in the sense that he doesn't want to settle for one woman. Our difference is that he'll string two dolls along at the same time. Two or three, or ten. I can't do that. I'm either available and dick around and the women know it's just fun, which is essentially me most of the time, or there are the few occasions in my life when I'm with someone. Three times it happened to me. The last was the worst. It was however what drew me closer to Gabe. We've both loved women who belong to other men. Arranged marriages are big in our world. Crime families marry their daughters off, some are debts, some are straight up payments. Gabe's was a payment. Mine was a debt. Vanessa, my, well she wasn't my anything. She was a debt. The sort you couldn't get out of without starting a blood war. In my world you have to know when to back the fuck down and back off. You have to know when to stay behind the line set up for you. That was what happened to me. Didn't change the fact that I loved her and I haven't loved since. I met her here at the club. The club's opening almost feels like it was an expression of freedom. I don't like putting it that way though because I was never restricted in my life the way most people are. We're all like that in my family. No restriction. It was how Gabe came to be with his Charlotte. It's been ten years and I know he hasn't forgotten her. This broad on the phone talking to him is one of his attempts to try. The same goes for Mimi. 
Unfortunately for her and unfortunately for me because it's fucking 8.20 and Gabe is still on the fucking phone. There's a reason why I wanted to finish all that I need to say to him well before now. The reason is MIA. I'm pretty sure she's either here or nearly here. I want to give her my full attention. I want to forget today. Another fruitless fucking day that saw me with no answers. I knew Vincent would be doing his part to search and gather intel where he could, what we were doing though was searching the lower levels of the underground. I started with Billy's restaurant and talked to people who knew him. Good idea, except that nobody knew a damn thing, and if they did they wouldn't squeal to people like us without a threat. Threats and blood, body parts missing. Shit like that, that could coerce a person to talk. Shit that could and would land me in shit with Pa and Vincent if it got back to them. Then with their fucked up fantasy to preserve order. With the streets being a no-go, the next thing I thought of doing was a thorough check through Tommy's stuff at the office and at his house. Paperwork and Files Page 37 We tackled the office first, because I didn't want to involve Sharon until I had to. I was hoping to find some clues but there was nothing amongst his paperwork and everything on his computer from files to emails were all encrypted with some type of firewalls and passwords none of us could get past. It enraged me, but it was suspicious as fuck because we all use passwords, just not the way he did. The plan tomorrow is to get someone from our technical support team to decrypt them so we can see if there's anything on his computer we can use. Everything that is happening makes me want to breathe fire because of that helplessness that looms over my fucking head. It reminds me that I can't do anything. Nothing at all. Nothing more than what I'm doing which feels like a waste of time. And Gabe is still on the fucking phone. I glower at my brother as he asks the doll what color her nipples are. Accepting I'll have his attention when he decides to give it I give up on him and allow myself to get lost in what's happening below us. The club is packed as always. Always packed and I get the feeling that no matter how much we charge, people will still come. We charge $200 for a standard ticket, $500 for the general VIP lounge, $700 for the sex dungeons. Every night the tickets sell out. We make six figures a night, sometimes seven when we have special events. To be fair though, every night's an event. People hear things about the Dark Odyssey. They come for the sex. Of course they would come for the sex. It's taboo. People love anything that's taboo. Even the fuckers who think they don't like it, do. It's all the holier-than-thou ones who try to restrain themselves. Sex is a very interesting thing. There's something about it that's forbidden and desirable all at once. The people here like watching like we do and they like fucking like we do. I can't believe a whole eight years have gone by since we set this place up. It was Georgie's seriously wild idea. Masquerade parties every night in a sex club. Fuck yeah. He's the most liberal of all of us. Liberal as in he's been married to his doll for the last seven years but he shares her with his best friend. Yeah. Liberal like that, but it works. He banded together with us to set the place up and while we don't see him as much as he used to we all take pride in our accomplishment to push the limits of fantasy. We'd set up the place to create a, safe environment for people to live out their fantasies and boy do they ever. They are all doing it now. Although we don't allow sex on the dance floor, from where I'm sitting it looks like a massive orgy below us, from the way everyone's dancing. And, from the people in the cubicles. The usual businessmen are in the private cubicles on the outskirts and on the floor. There are people having threesomes, foursomes, fivesomes. Most of the groups have more men than women. The men all share the women. I like that dynamic. Even though I don't like sharing. Tried it many times and hated it. Gabe and Salvatore are different. They don't mind. I just like to watch. It's the watching part that we like. As if I'm not pissed off enough at Gabe for being on his damn call for so long, Robbie approaches me from the side entrance. He has paperwork in his hands. That means he's found something out about MIA. 
Of course I followed through on my plan to have her checked out. This is my guy who does all that for me, he's just late and he's got that tentative look on his face because he knows I don't like late. What the fuck took you so long? I snarl. Truth be told I almost forgot he was supposed to come see me before eight. It's all the fucking shit on my mind. I can't focus on what I'm supposed to. Sorry boss, I had one last thing to check out, he hands me the paperwork. I take it and cut him a crude glance. He knows I'm pissed but I won't take it out on him. He's been my street guy since we opened the club and I trust him. Trust is a hard thing to come by in our world. I scan over the document and see that Mia's a lawyer and her credentials are as long as my arm. Fucking hell, my eyes snap wide when I see Harvard listed in her academic qualifications. Harvard. She studied at Harvard and got into Silverman's in LA. Page 38. Even the best people I know never got into a firm like that. I look at Robbie who's already giving me that expression of suspicion. Father's sick. He's in hospital as we speak. She has an older brother and a niece. Nine years old. They all live together. He summarizes. Her father's a software developer, runs his own business but hasn't done anything all year. House has been remortgaged and he took out a business loan. He quirks a brow on that last part. Gabe's off his call now and looking at me with interest. I've seen this sort of thing many times. Anything that looks like it might be legit, most often isn't. It all looked fine until he talked about the house being remortgaged and the business loan. She owes someone, Gabe fills in. I cut him a crude glance because I'm surprised he heard anything. The father owes someone, I impart. It's what I figure from what the intel isn't saying and her actions over the last few days. It's the father, I'm guessing it's him. I tap the document and think about it. Her father owes someone and she needed ten grand to pay them. I gave her twenty so she could pay her debt and not have to worry. I just threw it in for good measure. What should I do? Want me to get access to bank statements? We could see more, Robbie asks. I shake my head. I don't want to pry too much. She's agreed to take the job here with me. So the situation is in hand. No need to dig around deeper. Not right now. It does however make me wonder how much she owes. Would the 20 GS I gave her cover it? Or did she owe more? Maybe I'd find out. It's not important now, and not when I have her right where I want her. She owes me for the advance so I have her on that front. No, that's not necessary yet. Keep eyes on her though, just in case it turns into something to worry about. Robbie nods and backs away. What the hell's this? Gabe asks, flicking the edge of the document in my hand. None of your business, I snap. Prick, you like her. You wouldn't go through all that trouble if you didn't. I narrow my eyes at him and put the document in my jacket pocket. Gabe, you've already pissed on the few minutes I needed to talk to you, don't piss me off even more. Come on man. I was talking to Alana, you seen the tits on that woman? I'm meeting her later. He chuckles. And Mimi? Meeting her after for more fucking. He laughs now. I roll my eyes at him. You get on my nerves man. Don't take a moral high ground with me. Our ways are different, but we're the same, brother. I just divide my attention between my women. You focus yours on one at a time. Look at you with this woman. You actually had her checked out and don't think I didn't see her contract. Your personal waitress, Nick. You just got yourself a real-life fuck toy. I smile. Sure it looks like that, but part of it isn't. Like I said, it's none of your business. What is your business is today's shit. He frowns and straightens up, resuming the tension which had prior to his call. He sighs with frustration. It's all so fucked up. It sure is. 
fucked up, and worrying because I know if something is hard in our world, it means there's more at work. The Fontaines involving a guy they know to be associated with the Giordanos is big. It suggests betrayal on Tommy's part and I don't want to think like that. Page 39. I want to say that Tommy wouldn't do a thing like that but my best friend had already disrespected me by associating with people who would kill me if they could. I can't say because he was my friend he wouldn't do whatever this shit is to me. What I do know is he must have had a good reason. A fucking good reason. Gabe presses his lips together and shuffles in his chair. Nick, I didn't want to be the one to say this, but fuck, I'm just going to say it. I think Tommy was dealing. I think maybe he was some kind of dealer. Billy said he overheard the guy say Tommy could hook them up. Dealing. I'd thought of that, but the fact that chrysanthemum was also mentioned makes me think otherwise. I don't know Gabe. Those drugs are hard to come by. I think. My damn voice trails off. I was going to say that I'd know about it if Tommy was dealing. The truth is I doubt it. Everything that's happened and is happening makes me doubt I'd know anything. I've been scanning through possibilities and ending up with shit. Maybe he was dealing but it doesn't explain everything else. It doesn't give any answer to why he was gunned down. That's what I want to know. The answer and a name. I want to know who did it. Who put the hit on him and who fired the bullet. Gabe rests a hand on my shoulder and sighs. Hey, something will come up. Just got to keep looking. We'll see what we find on the computer. Then maybe we'll know what to do next. I nod, definitely agreeing. We'll grab Salvatore in the morning, I answer. Salvatore is more technically minded than any of us. It was the fact that he couldn't get into Tommy's computer that made us suspicious of what could be on there. I'm about to elaborate but there's a sudden movement to my left. The talk of Tommy took my mind off her. M.I.A. Angel Doll. She approaches us with that coyness I've seen her exhibit every time. I thought it was shyness, now I know she's a lawyer I know it's not that she's shy. She's wary of me and afraid. That's what it is. Tonight the coyness is masked by how she looks. That blonde hair has been done up and cascades down her shoulders in long graceful waves. She's got that smoky eye makeup that makes her eyes piercing, stunning and breathtaking. Her skin is flawless with a shimmer to it. I'm already taken with her face and her hair, but the rest of her robs my mind of thought. She's wearing a gold negligee that clings to her body, caressing her the way I want to. Everything but the cups of the built-in bra and the lining that covers her mound is see-through. Good. Mimi knew what I meant when I said take care of her. I gave specific instructions because I don't want anybody looking at all the parts of this woman I want for myself. I don't want any other man touching her, or looking at her. End of story. In her hands is a little gold masquerade mask. She would have been wearing it on her travel up to me from downstairs. It hides your identity. Take the mask off when you want to reveal it. I stand and move to her. Gabe clears his throat in a very exaggerated manner. No intro, brother, he says with a sinful smile as he looks over my doll. No. I simply reply. He's such a fucking prick. He's seen the contract and all the paperwork. He knows her name but thinks he can pull rank in seniority, by making me introduce her, because he's two years older than me. He laughs. No? Page 40. I hate the way he's looking at her. Looking at her breasts. It's one thing Mimi can't hide. M.I.A. has the kind of breasts best reserved for fantasies. It would be great in a place like this to bring in more money. But she's mine and only I get to play with those. No, I tell him again. So not sharing. He leans forward and turns up the stair even more. He knows if he wasn't my brother I'd shoot his dick off. Fuck the hell off Gabe and don't cross me. Don't fucking do it. I point at him and he looks at me and sees I'm serious as fuck. 
The cunning expression falls from his face and he resumes his composure. I look back to MIA and see her cheeks are flushed with the soft rose color I adore. When she looks at me the unease fades, only slightly though. Only slightly does it fade, which is also good because I don't want her to be comfortable with me. I like that she's wary because she should be. Taking her hand, I lead her away from Gabe. We go to the upper floor so we can talk first before I give her the tour. Her hand feels so small, but I like that her fingers are laced in between mine. We get to the balcony on the raised platform and I release her. This is where we come when we have events. Us brothers and our friends. I take a step back and look her over. You look beautiful, I tell her. Mimi would have given her the negligee to wear. Everything else though would have been her. Her cheeks flush again. Thank you. And you showed up. I showed up. Thank you for the money. I appreciate it. I really appreciated it. She nods and I can see she did. I knew she would. It was why I gave it. Don't mention it. $20,000 is a lot not to mention, she points out. And yet it was spare change to me. Did it help you? Yes, big time. I hope she didn't pay all of it on the debt. Whatever the debt is. Sick father and a niece to take care of. That's a handful. What happened to the niece's parents? Robbie mentioned she had a brother. Why isn't he helping? Maybe he is. She seems to have come from what I call a good two shoes vanilla family. Maybe they just fell into a lot of debt. I guess me helping gives me kudos points. Good. No more talk of money. Understand. I ask, because I want that element I crave. Ha. Huh. Page 41. I do. I understand. I want all of her and when I'm inside her I just want her to be thinking of me. Just me and the pleasure. That's all. Nothing else. First I want to prep her and give her a taste of my world. I reach forward and pick up a lock of her hair. It curls around my thumb as I run my fingers over it. It feels soft with a slight crisp, probably from hairspray. This for me? I ask. She blushes again and her eyes dart to the floor then climb back up to meet mine. Maybe. Maybe. I like that, but it's not what I want to hear. I like the sass the answer carries with it and the spark of sensuality in her eyes, but I want the control. Maybe. I say that with an edge of the serious tone I took with Gabe. It should have done the trick to put her back in line but to my surprise a little smile tugs at the corners of her lips. It's the first time I've seen her smile. It's not a full smile, just the hint of one and it does something to me. You want me to say yes, she challenges. I'm not going to tell you to say yes and make you obey like a robot. She presses her lips together. Yes. She says and gives me a full smile. I'm not saying yes because I was told to. Sassy, and very sexy. Very, very sexy. Her personality is coming out and that's what I want. This must be close to what she's like when she's a lawyer. I like it, but I'm boss. I reassert myself when I step forward and she backs away like she usually does. She backs against the pillar and looks at me, eyes slightly wide. People can see us and that's the point. I reach out and move away the cup of her bra covering her right breast and expose her breast right there. She lets me, and she will let me do what I have planned next. Someone passes by us and her face goes beetroot red. I smile at her response and I bend down to cover the light pink tip of her nipple with my mouth, sucking hard. While she's shocked at that, I slide my hand up her thigh, move her panties to one side and slip my fingers in her already wet pussy. My cock hardens at the discovery, and I want to fuck her right here up against the pillar for all to see. She moans and I'm tempted but I stop sucking. I don't stop sliding my fingers inside her though. She likes it. I can tell and I want her to say it. 
You like that angel doll? Hum hum. She moans and presses into the pillar. Good. I love how wet you are for me. Stay just like that. I stop then. This is part of the prep, part of her tour. By the time I'm ready for her, she'll be begging me to take her. I bring my hands up to my mouth and lick the sweet nectar from my fingers. She tastes sweeter tonight. Sweet on desire. I can't wait to make her come. Page 42. Chapter 11, MIA, God. I watch him lick his fingers and it turns me on. As usual I don't know what to think. The moment I start and my brain comes back from the high it's been on, he covers me back up, fixing my dress. He does that and acts like nothing really happened. Nothing more than what we've been doing. Nothing more than him sucking my breast and fingering me in front of people. Yes, of course I'm wet. Apart from what he did, it was also the fact that people were watching. There was a waiter with a tray of drinks who seemed to be making his way over to where we'd come from. Where his brother was. The man passed by but watched as Nick sucked and fingered me. There was something insanely arousing about being watched. I almost get the drift of this place. I don't know what's supposed to happen now. I know what will happen at some time tonight and I made sure I took my birth control a little earlier than planned. I ordered a couple more packs from the doctors today too, so I don't have a day where I run out or cause to be late. With my lack of sex since Chad left, yeah it's been a year since I had sex, I've been slacking. The other day Chloe told me she read somewhere that women on the pill had better skin because of the extra estrogen. Since I could no longer afford to buy beauty creams, I figured I'd get back on track with my daily pill dosage. Who would have thought I'd actually need it for the purpose it's intended for? He puts out his hand to take mine and I give it to him. Where are we going? I ask, still trying to steady my breath. This is part of your induction. I'm giving you the tour of the Dark Odyssey. Tour, oh God. Do I really want to see it all? I glance down at the glass ceiling and see the people on the dance floor having a wild time. I can't hear the music from up here, but it seems to be one of those mixes that gets people moving. The crowd on the floor are dancing like they're at a rave. Like the other night though, there are a lot of people having sex on the sidelines. Ready, he asks. I bow my head for a slow nod because I'm as ready as I'll ever be. I don't know what the hell I'm going to see beyond what I already have. I'm ready. Put your mask back on baby. I put the mask on and look at him. He smiles. I expect him to put on a mask too. He doesn't though. I guess he doesn't need to hide who he is. He's the boss. He takes my hand and leads me to the elevator. He presses the ground floor button and we go down. That's where all the action is. All of it. The door pings open and we're there. Page 43. The music instantly washes over us, loud and vibrant. There are men in masks by the entrance and they all look at me. As if on instinct, Nick releases my hand and slips his arm around my waist, protectively pulling me close. Showing I'm his. They look away, all of them simultaneously. I'm in my heels. Six-inch heels Mimi gave me and prayed I could walk in them. She said Nick likes heels. It made me wonder about the other women he's been with. Women he's been with under normal circumstances who hadn't gone to him looking for a job. Not like me. It begs the question of what I am? Personal waitress, so what am I doing? Getting him drinks and being a fuck toy at his request for a hundred grand a year. That's what it is. I can't push that part aside no matter what. I can't even deny it or turn it into meaning something else. Not the way I would if this were some intellectual property dispute and my client wanted to ascertain their ownership of a particular idea or trademark. This is not that, and thinking about law right now isn't helping me. I was in my element in LA but it wasn't even the fact of being in LA. It was because Silverman's really valued me, and I saw myself going places. 
I meant it under the best senior partner there. Her name was Olivia Hawthorne. I wanted to be like her. Strong and beautiful, married with kids and still with the zest for her career. I'm here now, on the arm of a seriously drop-dead gorgeous guy, in his sex club and I don't know when I can think about law again. Feels like another life I lived. Worse when I look at the people around me. We're walking slower as we move further into the crowd. Again everyone looks normal, having a good time. The women in their lingerie laugh as they dance and the men are in boxes. Everyone's wearing masks. It looks like an erotic lingerie party. At the dancers wearing masks in their see-through bras and thongs on the raised platforms dotting each corner of the room and I would say it definitely passes for an erotic lingerie party. The whole setup is actually quite fascinating. The people, the style, the acrobats on the aerial hoops and everything really. I'm just not used to it. We move over to the furthest end and suddenly we're up close to the outskirt cubicles where the people are having sex. These cubicles don't look like the Arabian tent style ones above us that I passed the other day to get to Nick's office. They're nice but more like the chill out areas you'd see in a VIP lounge at a regular club. Just way more classy, with padded leather sofas the people are sprawled on. Nick stops with me beside the first cubicle. There's a woman and two men having a threesome. All are naked except for the masks. As I watch them it dawns on me that the mask doesn't just conceal who you are. The shield of it beckons me to stare. And stare I do without blushing or feeling as uneasy as I did the other day without it. I'd worn my mask up to find Nick earlier but I didn't really see that many people on the way to him. Not like this. The woman sits in between the two guys, stroking their cocks while they suck her breasts. The guy to her left has his fingers in her pussy, fingering her. My mouth waters and my breath hitches, the longer I look. The heat creeps into my cheeks and my whole body flushes when the guy to her left stops sucking her breast and pulls her onto his lap. She straddles him, going down on his cock and he starts to fuck her. I look away, straight to Nick and see he's not watching them, his eyes are on me and there's a smirk on his face. On the balcony he told his brother he wouldn't share me. I can't even believe I'm thinking about that sharing. Maybe I can stand to watch but I don't want to be shared. He might have told his brother no, but that didn't mean all that much. What if there are other people he would share me with? Again I ask myself what the hell I've gotten myself into. Today was so busy with all I had to sort out that I didn't speak to Chloe. She knew I wanted to talk but I didn't tell her what about. As far as my best friend knows, I'm still job hunting and I turned this down. She doesn't know that since we last spoke only yesterday all manner of shit has happened to me. Nick doesn't say anything. I wouldn't have heard him anyway because the music is so loud. Instead he moves along the cubicles with me like he's taking me on a tour at the museum and we're looking at some prehistoric display of people. The next cubicle isn't all that different, I suppose from what would have happened at that time. Page 44. The people inside are having an orgy. All of them. Men with men and women, women with women and men, men with men. I actually gasp from the shock of what I'm seeing. Unlike the other couple, I don't feel the protection of the mask. It's too much for me to take in and I look away. I look away and Nick notices. I'm grateful when he moves me along. I find something else to focus on as we proceed down the pathway nestled between the dancing bodies and the people having sex. I keep my focus on the patterns on the floor. It's like crystal and has the appearance of dancing on water. I didn't notice it before. Granted when you came to a place like this, I was pretty sure the floor was the last thing you'd notice in comparison to everything else going on around you. I look back up and we pass by another couple in a cubicle. It's just the two of them. They aren't wearing masks and the way they touch each other is different. Nick steadies me as we stop and watch. The people inside look like they can't get enough of each other, like they're so into each other they could be anywhere. The man holds the woman against him as she rides him and he strokes her back. 
Nick pulls me away just as they pull apart and kiss. I feel then like I'd actually intruded on something private. It's weird because all of it should be private. I look at Nick and I'm not sure what he's thinking as we proceed down the path. He's either decided we've had enough of the floor, or that I've seen enough. We go through a door at the end of the hall and there's a set of stone steps. My heels clank against them. I seriously start wondering what I'm about to see next. Feels like being led down into a dungeon. When we get down the steps I realize why this feels like a dungeon. It's because it is. A sex dungeon. I tense at the thought and my mouth goes dry as we enter another large hall. The music down here is different. It's more jazz-like and low enough to hear screams of an orgasm from the furthest end of the room and the echo of flesh slapping together. There's more people having sex down here than above on the main floor. The room is also filled with equipment I've heard Chloe talk about. The people around us down here are a combo of leather and gowns and formal wear like you'd actually see at a Venetian ball. The people in gowns are wearing masks. I notice some of the women in leather have a collar around their necks and they cling to the men next to them. A little like I hadn't realized before, that I'm clinging to Nick. It fascinates him when he notices me realize. I look to the cubicles here and that's where the shock factor amplifies as I watch a woman being flogged and spanked. It looks painful, nevertheless she's crying out for more. In the cubicle next to them it looks like the same sort of thing has gone on but the couple inside are having sex. BDSM. I get it in an instant, thanks to my sex lessons from Chloe and I think the men around are all doms and the women are their subs. The way they are is a little different. Some of them are close and the way that the women cling to their men is something I can't stop looking at. It's very intimate. Almost as intimate as the couples having sex. I'm seriously going to have a hard time forgetting all this. My blood is so hot it burns as it travels through my veins. I don't know why I think this but the whole setting looks like a twisted scene in interview with the vampire, minus the vampires and add in the people wearing leather. Yes. That's what it feels like, like I'm not sure if I should be fascinated, or wigged out or both. I think it's the way they're all touching each other. Like animals would. It's a little predatory and animalistic. A man approaches Nick and smiles at both of us. In his mask, most of his face is covered. It's one of those Phantom of the Opera masks but with the masquerade design as opposed to what you'd see in the musical. I wouldn't have been able to tell what his expression was if he hadn't smiled. Nick smiles at him and stretches out his hand to greet him. I move to give him more freedom to interact but he pulls me back against him. I don't miss the urgent possessiveness in his touch. The man smiles wider and looks from Nick to me. Nicoli Giordano, you don't usually venture down here. Can't remember when last I've seen you. The man booms in a hearty tone. I try to assess him from what I can see. He's Italian like Nick but there's a presence about him I can't ignore. Stronger than Nick's. He's older. I'd say maybe mid to late forties. Page 45. Marco Antonella, it's good to see members of the Antonella clan in my fold, Nick answers. He places an emphasis on the name Antonella. Do not lie. You wouldn't have any old Antonella here with your alliance with Claudius Morients. I don't know who they're talking about. I assume he's important from the way Nick tenses against me. You're right, then again you're a special Antonella, aren't you? Not sure how many Antonellas in your fold are doms with a harem of subs, Nick throws back. Now the man tenses. It's clear he doesn't like the comment. Once upon a time you used to live like a dom, have you returned to your former ways? Marco glances at me. I swallow hard. Nick was a dom? Okay, I need to calm myself. This isn't like we're dating and I just met him somewhere and we're trying to get to know each other. Nick smiles. Maybe. I look at him and Marco looks to me again. Is this your new sub, he looks at me like he wants to eat me and my heartbeat speeds up. 
Yes, Nick answers and his gaze snaps away from me. I see, well done, Marco smiles and tips his head before he backs away. That was all he had to say. Nick leans in close to my ear and whispers, enough. Enough? I ask. I've shown you enough. Is there more? Yes, much, but you've seen enough. Instead of going back the way we came, we continue to the door at the end of the hall. We go through it and up another set of stairs that leads back up to the main floor. I hear the music already and brace myself to go back out. Then my breath catches and I realize I can't go out just yet. I stop and tug him to stop too. There are too many questions floating around in my head. He doesn't like that I stopped but I have to know more. At least he releases me when I pull from him. The look he's giving me resembles how he was that first day we met. It's similar to the people we just left and I understand why he has that predatory look if he used to be a dom. I'm sorry. I have questions. What am I? I'm not sure what I'll do if he says sub. I don't understand it but I know I don't like pain inflicted on me of any kind. The corners of his mouth lift into a sexy smile. You're MIA Chase. That's who I am, not what. I'm supposed to be your personal waitress but I haven't done anything a waitress does. You want me to be yours but I don't know what you mean. Page 46. He moves to me and cups my face. You know what I mean MIA. He's right. I do know. I'm being paid to have sex with him. That's what it boils down to. What else will I have to do? That's all. I won't share you with anybody, even if you want to be shared. I don't like or have the desire to share things that belong to me. His eyes pierce into me and I can't look away. I belong to him. God. Belonging is a nice thought and as I look at him something reaches out to me that makes me want to accept the idea, even though my brain won't accept it. I'm not a dom, am I, and you aren't my sub. I told Marco you were because he respects their ways. He's one of the most dangerous men in Chicago and if certain people were to know of his presence in my club there would be hell to pay. He approached me because he wanted to buy you. My heart stills right there in my chest. Oh my god. He smiles. Don't worry. I won't let anybody take you. He steps back, dropping his hand from my chin and I catch my breath. How does it all work? I mean everyone here looks so comfortable. Because they are. All kinds of people come here for the experience. Is that why you have this place? I have to ask. I just have to. I've never met anybody like him before. Never, not even close. A slow easy smile dances on his lips. The experience is one reason. The fantasy another. It's dark and alluring. I cater for everybody. I believe people should be allowed to live out their fantasies. Our fantasies are part of who we are. Okay, that's something I didn't think of. Living a fantasy. He smacks and continues. The masks make them more comfortable to do it. They wear masks to cover who they are, and only take it off when they want to reveal themselves. The men come in and get a seal to pass to a person they want to invite for more than a dance. That's how it starts. How it ends is up to them. What about the waitresses? Where are they? I didn't see any. You saw them mingling with the crowd. Except they look like regulars. There's no real difference. In the billionaire's lounge upstairs, the guys can have their own waitresses and it's up to them what they want to do. I release a slow breath. Is that what I'll be doing? He touches my face. The man who can touch you is me. You will come here in the evenings and come find me. Then we'll take it from there. I blink as I look at him. I'm trying to process it. That's it? That's all. Want to do more? Isn't life hard enough as it is? Yeah. Well Angel Doll, let's not make it harder, 
he drops his hand to mine and runs his finger up my arm and back to my waist. Leaning in close he whispers, dance with me. His voice is a sexy rumble that makes my body flush with heat and anticipation. Yes, I answer. His lips arch into an easy grin and he pulls me closer to him so he can slip his arm around me again. When we go out to the main floor, the music changes to something more sensual, but upbeat. It's a mix of a song I really like. Touch me. I follow him as he leads me into the sea of bodies clashing together. We start dancing. Me pressed up against him and him holding me, looking at me like he wants to devour me. It's then the lure of him truly entices me and I forget reality all over again. Page 47 Chapter 12, MIA Nick moves behind me and slips his arm back around my waist. That force washes over me like it did last night and the other day. Passion. That's what it is. Tonight it's accompanied by desire. It washes over me and over him too and it's like this song was made for us because we start dancing as if we'd practiced. But, he's holding me against him so I can feel his erection pressing into my ass. His hands run down the length of my waist and smooth over it, right up to cup my breasts and I press into him. I press into him and hold his hands against me, wanting his touch. Wanting him. It's the effect of him. The effect he has on me. Making me want him. Making me want him so bad I forget all the reasons I shouldn't. I wiggle my hips and he grinds against me, dipping his head to my neck so he can trace a line of hot fiery kisses over my skin. We stay like this for the whole song, just moving against each other. At the end he turns me to him and I find myself smiling. He takes my face again and whispers into my ear when the volume of the music drops to change. Naughty girl, you like me, he breathes. I turn my face to him and brush against his nose. Maybe, I whisper back. He cups my breast again and runs his finger over the diamond hard nipple. It's begging to be touched as bad as the rest of my body. If this were anywhere else I wouldn't be like this. Maybe. He takes my hand and places it against the bulge of his cock pressing against his pants. He closes my hand over it and a little breath escapes my lips. He smiles the wicked smile, sinful in every way and holds down hard on my hand, encouraging me to rub up and down his length. I do, and continue when he releases my hand. That's how much I like you, angel doll. Fuck. He's massive and seems to grow in my hands. He comes back down and captures my mouth for a hungry kiss while I rub his cock. When he pulls away, he takes my hand. Time to go, he rasps out. The music gets louder but we head away from the dance floor. We pass all sorts of stuff happening, but all I see is him. All I want is him. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. He takes me back to the elevator, taps the button for the sixth floor, a floor I've never been on. Page 48. He reclaims my lips before I get the chance to ask where we're going. He shoves me up against the wall and we kiss like we've always kissed like this. Like we've known each other forever and not just a few days. It's been a few days and he's my boss. How can I feel this wild desire for a man I just met when I never felt like this with Chad? This is something more than I've felt for anybody and I don't know how I should feel about that. My brain keeps fighting against the haze of lust to bring reality back to focus. Bringing the reason I'm here back to my mind. Dad needs me, Beth needs me. What about me though? I'm in need of so much and this man who I know is a mobster, is giving me what I need right now. When he picks me up I wrap my legs around him and he takes off my mask. All the while still kissing me. The elevator pings and the door opens. Motion sensor lights come on and I pause our kiss to look around me. Nick then carries me into a bedroom that looks like something from heaven. He sets me down on plush white carpet so thick my feet sink into it. The needy look has returned to his eyes but this time I'm not wary of it. I want him to look at me the way he does. Baby, take your clothes off for me, he demands and looms over me, 
towering over me with his height. Even in my heels I only reach the top of his chest. Taking my clothes off this time feels like something I want to do for him. I slip down the little straps of the negligee first, then pull the zipper on the side. It floats down to the carpeted floor pooling at my feet. His smile turns up when I undo the little butterfly clasp on my bra and my breasts spill out. He moves close to play with my nipples while I take off my panties. Leave the heels on Angel Doll. I straighten up and he returns to my lips, kissing me and moving back with me to the wall. Once he has me pinned against it, he devours my mouth and moves across to my neck to kiss me there. He sucks on my neck hard and we both know that's going to leave a mark. Nick moves down the trail of my neck to my chest, kissing, nipping, tasting. His hands circle over my breasts first and then his mouth follows. He starts his wild suckle and I moan, moaning into the wild pleasure that takes me. It feels okay now. So okay I forget who he is and why I'm here and smooth my hand over his head to encourage him to continue sucking. It just feels so damn good I forgot. I flinch when I remember and he stops to look at me. Don't be scared to touch me baby. If you want me to suck your tits for you I'll do it. God, he's so sexy. This is so sexy, wild and hot. Yes. I nod, wanting him to continue and he does. He closes his mouth over my other nipple and sucks hard. He sucks and takes in as much of the flesh as he can. The sight is so hot it makes me wet. He sucks and alternates from one breast to the other, giving me wild pleasure beyond my imagination. This is just the beginning though. Nick takes the wildness to the next level when he slides his fingers inside my pussy and starts moving in and out. Sliding in and out. Slow at first then fast and faster, and faster until I cry out. He rubs over my clit and he must feel that I'm close because the sinful look in his eyes is enough to give me that orgasm. Don't come until I say, angel doll, he murmurs. What? God, I'm so close. It's there. How can I hold it? Page 49. He rubs over my clit and smiles up at me. You don't come until I say. I can't answer, his words turn me on and push me close to the edge. He crouches down and parts my legs wide then nuzzles his face between my thighs so he can thrust his tongue into my pussy. I don't know how he expects me to hold my release when he does that. I struggle against the pleasure he's giving me. I'm struggling and I don't know how much longer I can hold back. Not when he's licking, and sucking on my clit the way he is. Nick. I cry out his name and he looks up at me with fascination at the fact that I called out his name. Not yet baby. Not yet. I bend forward and he catches my right nipple in between his thumb and forefinger, tweaking the light pink tip then stroking over the flesh. He sucks hard on my clit and my knees buckle, turning to water beneath me. It's all I can take. I'm going insane, I'm almost at the brink of insanity. Nick. I moan with desperation and he lifts his head. Come for me angel doll. Come. Like I've been doing, I do as he says and I come hard and violently. I throw my head back, arching into him as I cry out against my release. The luxuriating sensation washes over me, inside and out as I come in his mouth and he drinks. His tasting and drinking, feasting on me, licking and still stroking my clit, licking until he's taken every last drop. I can't catch my breath and watching him licking my pussy is making me wet all over again. He backsteps and rises to his feet. Like always I'm left with the buzz of his touch but wanting more. I really hope he's not going to leave me again. Why would we come up here if he was going to do that? He stops my next thoughts with another kiss. It's scorching hot and burns me up from the inside out. It's like someone threw a match on a trail of gasoline and lit me up. Suddenly I'm grabbing onto his shirt and kissing him hard too, kissing him like I need him. I pull hard on his shirt and the buttons pop. They fall to the floor and clatter over the marble. I start to smooth my hands over his chest, touching his best skin that's tight and ripped with muscles, 
but he catches my hand, shoves me back hard into the wall and pins it above my head. With his free hand he clasps a hand around my throat. I suck in a sharp breath against the grasp. Fear lances through me as I'm unsure of what he's doing. The only thing I've figured with this guy is that every time I get close to him, like I've stepped over the line, he does something to stop me in my tracks. Like now. He gives me a luscious leer and the corners of his sexy mouth arches into a wicked smile. Fear, and desire. I like it. He continues to hold me in the lock and watches me. What do you want me to do to you angel doll? His voice is hard yet soothing. It holds the air of need in it. What do you need me to do to you? The question throws me. I hate that he can see how desperate I am. Not the desperate woman who came into his office days ago who needed a job. That woman was just thinking about her family. The me today is so different to her. Tonight I'm desperate for him and he sees it for truth. Shame and embarrassment seeps into me. I feel shame because I'm so needy. I feel shame because I want him and shouldn't. I feel shame in every essence, but desire is a much more powerful emotion. Desire mingled with passion is unstoppable. Page 50 So, what do I need and want him to do to me? Exactly what I'm here for. Except I thought that was more for him. Not me. Fuck me, the words fall from my lips on the edge of a breath. He advances close and presses his nose to mine. What was that, baby? Fuck me. Beg me for it. Beg me for my cock. Darkness flashes beneath his stare, mingling with captivation. He looks at me knowing I'll do as he says, because I want it. Need it. Fuck me, please. A menacing smile lights up his face. With pleasure, he growls and releases me. I slump against the wall and watch him back off his jacket. He doesn't undo his buttons on his shirt. What I've ripped is enough for him to pull it up and over his head. He whips it off and throws it to the side. My eyes land on his body. His wide, powerful chest and bulging biceps. I'm looking at the creative artwork of the tattoos going down the right side of his abs against the peaks and valleys. All Japanese characters. I'm looking at a work of art, but mostly I'm looking at the masterpiece he is standing before me like a vengeful god ready to exact vengeance and power over me. He undoes his belt buckle and unzips his fly. As he does, his pants drift down his legs and he pulls down his boxers too, unleashing the length of his massive cock. He steps out of his clothes and comes to me. We're both naked, standing together and it feels like the world fades away, leaving us here. My lips part and he grabs hold of my waist and turns me around to face the wall. I bend over and allow my hair to fall forward as he takes hold of both my hips and runs his hands over me. I look back because I want to see him. He takes hold of his cock and guides the fat head to my entrance. I look back to the wall as he teases my folds open and gasp when he rams into me and instantly starts moving inside me. I should have known he wouldn't be the kind of man to take it slow an inch in. He has too much power. He has far too much control over me and it feels like he wants to fuck me just as badly as I want him. I cry out from the impact as he fills me completely and it feels so damn good to finally have him inside me. He starts fucking me instantly and because I'm already ready for him, my body welcomes the wild thrusts he gives me, pumping hard, moving faster and faster. Faster, until he's rutting into me with a raw primal force that's carnal. I moan into the wild pleasure as my breasts bounce up and down with every powerful thrust. Another orgasm coils deep in my groin. It rises and rises and takes me again, like before, sending me right over the edge of reason. This is what I need. This is what I want. Him. The thought cascades deep inside me as his hard powerful thrusts rock my body and he slips his hand around my waist so he can speed up. You feel so fucking good M.I.A., he growls against my neck. I can't answer. I'm not sure there's an answer other than he feels good too. I cry out when the blaze of my release pushes me to the pinnacle. 
Then he pulls out, turns me around and picks me up so he can settle me down on his cock. I wrap my legs around him and take him in, deep inside me. This position is just as good as the first, except it feels more intimate to stare into his eyes while he holds my face with one hand and presses me against him with the other. My breath hitches and for all I care, I could never take another breath for the rest of my life, just to have this moment, 